Today is Monday. We continue our series on Jesus' journey to the cross and we ask the question, what did Jesus do on the Monday before his death? On Monday, uh, the day after Jesus had his triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem, he went back to Jerusalem and he cleansed the temple. That was the main event that uh, happened on Monday in Jesus' life. Jesus cleansed the temple. And we can read this in Matthew chapter 21, verse 12 to verse 14. So let's read Matthew chapter 21, verse 12 to 14. Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, My house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple, and he healed them. But if you are familiar with uh, the story of Jesus found in the Gospels, you realize that uh, there are two cleansings of the temple. The first is described in John chapter 2, which probably took place in the initial stages of uh, Jesus' public ministry, probably in the first year. And the second is found in uh, Mark chapter 21, Mark, Matthew chapter 21, Mark chapter 11, and Luke chapter 19, uh, which describe another cleansing of the temple just days before his crucifixion. So, how many cleansings of the temple were there? Was, uh, were there two cleansings of the temple, or was it one cleansing, maybe described in a different way by the writers, by the gospel writers? Uh, let me show you a table uh, uh, to help us to answer this question. So, so I put down the details of the first cleansing of the temple in John chapter 2, and the details of the, of the second cleansing of the temple is found in Matthew chapter 21, for example. So if you look at, if you compare the details, you, you notice that uh, there are similarities and there are differences. For example, the similarity would be, uh, well, uh, both this cleansing took place just before the Passover. In the cleansing that is described in John chapter 2, let me refer to that as the first cleansing, Jesus used a whip of cords to, to chase the traders out of the temple. But uh, there's no mention of this in the second cleansing of the, of the temple. Uh, uh, in both cleansings, Jesus chased out the money changers. Jesus also chased out the sellers of the doves. And uh, however, in the uh, first cleansing of the temple in John chapter 2, Jesus called the temple my father's house. But in the second cleansing recorded in Matthew chapter 21, Jesus called the temple my house. So there is a difference there. In the cleansing of the temple recorded in uh, John chapter 2, the religious leaders demanded from Jesus proof that he had the authority to do what he did. And uh, Jesus answered them with, uh, by pointing to the sign of his resurrection, which of course they did not understand. But uh, this conversation, this exchange was never recorded in uh, the cleansing of the temple found in Matthew chapter 21. So what is the conclusion? When you look at the details of these two events, you realize that they are different. So it refers to two cleansings of the temple. Why, for example, in the cleansing of the temple recorded in Matthew that the leaders did not demand Jesus to prove that he had the right to do what he did? Well, the answer is because in the if there was a first cleansing, Jesus would have they would have asked that question and Jesus would have answered that question, and it was not necessary for them to ask this question on the second occasion. They knew what the answer would be. So, therefore, 
uh, there are two occasions in Jesus' life where he cleansed the temple. And uh, what we're looking at today in Matthew chapter 21 was the second occasion which took place just days before his crucifixion. And as a result of this event, uh, it caused the religious leaders to, to make determined and serious plans to eliminate Jesus. Now, what we are going to take home as lessons for today are two points. The first point is uh, found in verse 13, where Jesus said to them, My house will be called a house of prayer. My house will be called a house of prayer. So I want you to focus on the words, words house of prayer. That was how Jesus described the temple. If I were to ask the question, uh, what, is the temple is, what is the temple all about? Jesus would say, it is the house of prayer. Prayer, what is prayer? Prayer is basically that event where man and God comes together. It describes fellowship, man's fellowship with God, man's communion with God. When a person prays, he comes into contact with God. He speaks to God. He interacts, he interfaces with God. Heaven and earth meet at the moment of prayer. And man and God find each other. It's beautiful. That's what prayer is all about. Satan does not want it to happen. Satan hates prayer. Satan hates to see man turning to God and coming close to God and enjoying fellowship with God. That was why he tempted Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. So Satan does not want prayer to take place. So therefore he corrupted the temple. How did he corrupt the temple? Look at uh, what Jesus encountered in the temple. That made him very upset. And it just shows that he knew that the purpose of the temple had been corrupted. And that led him to, to do those things that we read of here. So let's look at the uh, those who sold animals. According to the law of Moses, if a person wants to worship God, he must give an animal sacrifice. Simple as that. The Jewish religion is ritualistic and very formal and ceremonial, very unlike our Christian faith. So you want to worship God, you want to uh, get something from God, you want forgiveness, for example, or you want good fortune, you want God to bless you, you give an animal sacrifice. And the law of the temple, law of uh, Moses says that you can only sacrifice, give a sacrifice to God in the temple, no place else. That is the only place in the whole country where you are allowed to give a sacrifice to God. So for people who live in other parts of the country, from Galilee, from other places, they have to bring their animals with them to Jerusalem to sacrifice. And uh, if, they, if someone doesn't have an animal to bring along on a long journey, they have to buy the animal at the temple. And that's where the people who sell animals come in. Now, even if someone were to bring his own animal to the temple, that animal could be rejected because there is this system in the temple that before an animal is accepted for sacrifice, a group of priests would examine the animal and they could say that the animal does not comply with the religious requirements for a sacrifice and the animal will be rejected. So what does that person do? He would have to buy an animal if he still wants to give a sacrifice to God. So you, you have this uh, system set up in the temple where a person could uh, go to a priest, pay, pay the required amount of money, and he would get a set of coupons, and with those coupons, he can go to another place, another section where he could give it to another priest, give a particular coupon, coupon to, a, to another priest, and that priest would give him a particular animal for his sacrifice. So a system had already been set up. So if you don't have an animal to sacrifice, you can buy it in the temple. 
from those people who were appointed by the temple officials to sell animals. Now, in those days, the, uh, the temple only accept Jewish shekels, the Jewish currency. They don't accept any other form of currency. During the time of Jesus, the country was under the control of the Roman Empire. And the currency in circulation at that time was the Roman currency. But the temple does not accept Roman coins because on the Roman coin you have an image of Caesar and that is against the Ten Commandments. So this money would have to be changed into Jewish shekels in order for people to buy animals from the temple. So this is where money changes come in. So there will be people appointed by the temple officials to change money. They have to be properly appointed. And uh, there are even guidelines as to what is the rate of exchange for each day or each week or, and so on. If you want to know more about this, I would recommend that you read this book by Alfred Edelstein, The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah. He also has another book called The Temple is services and sacrifices. Uh, Alfred uh, was a Jew. He was also a Christian. He lived in the Holy Land for many years and he uh, write this uh, wonderful record out of his personal observation uh, uh, during the time he was there. So, so you have this trade. The temple, there's this section of the temple that was like a market. And uh, if you want to know which part of the temple all this buying and selling of animals, changing of money take place, well, look at this picture of uh, the temple. And uh, in the outer rim of the temple, there's this place that is called the Court of the Gentiles. Now, this is where all these trading activities was taking place. The rabbinical literature at the time, from the time of Jesus, <coughs> described this whole trade, this whole thing, as the Bazaar of Annas. The Bazaar of Annas. Now, who is Annas? Well, we read of him in the New Testament. Annas was the high priest around the time when Jesus commenced his public ministry. He was a seems to be a perennial candidate to be the high priest. The high priest serves for one year. During, the, when, uh, during this time, uh, when Jesus was crucified, the high priest was Caiaphas, who was the son-in-law of Annas. And even though Annas was not high priest, when Jesus was arrested by the soldiers, he was taken to Annas first. Then from there, Jesus was went through a trial before the religious leaders. And after Jesus was found guilty by the religious leaders, but they didn't have the power to impose the death sentence on him, it was Annas who sent him to Pontius Pilate. So we see the influence and the power of Annas, even though he was not a high priest. And then maybe about a year or so later, when the church started in Jerusalem and the apostles started preaching Jesus Christ, Peter and the other apostles got into trouble. They were arrested for preaching Jesus Christ. And they were brought before Annas. That's right. He had resumed his office as high priest for that year. So, this marketplace in the temple was described as the Bazaar of Annas. Can you imagine the son of Annas walking around this market like a peacock? and pushing people around. And some people come up to him and say, and ask him, who do you think you are? Is this your father's house? He would probably say yes. That's the bazaar of Annas. Coming back to what we are talking about, the house of prayer and the importance of prayer. Just as Satan wanted to corrupt the temple as a house of prayer, Today, Satan wants to corrupt your prayer life. Yes, he wants to corrupt your prayer life. Your prayer life is important. The devil knows it. He knows that this is 
the place where you enjoy fellowship with God. When you pray, that's when you experience dependence on God. That's time when you exercise faith in God. And these things are very important experiences. They make up the sum total of the Christian life. It is the engine, the heart of your Christian life, without which you cannot function as a Christian. Prayer is important, and Satan wants to corrupt that. So he bring obstacles to prayer in our lives. What are the obstacles that we encounter? Firstly, doubt. There are people who agree that prayer is a good thing because if uh, you want to be religious, you should pray. Look, not only Christians, Hindus, Muslims, Buddhists, they all pray. So if you want to be religious, you should pray. It's part and parcel of religion. But I don't believe in prayer. I don't think it does anything. I don't think it can accomplish anything. So there are people who doubt that prayer can do anything. So if I do not believe in prayer, that prayer can do anything, why should I do it? There are people like that. There are people who are complacent. There are people who believe that prayer works, that when you pray, God listens and God answers. But Perhaps their life has been too comfortable. There have been no crises in their life. They are healthy, they are wealthy, things are going well, and there's no need to pray to God. So they could go through days, weeks, months without having to pray to God because there's really no need to pray to God. So they become complacent unless a crisis occurs. Another obstacle to prayer will be distractions. There are people who are so distracted by the world and the demands of daily life that they have no time for prayer. You wake up in the morning, you rush. You've got to get into your car, get to the office, and, and you work throughout the day, and, and when you come back late, you've got to struggle to find that quality time with your family, and by that time you're too tired, you go to sleep, and the next day you do that, go to the same process over, over and over again. Just don't have time for prayer. There are people who lack spiritual stamina. People who believe in prayer, who want to pray, who want an answer from God. But God does not seem to answer. I've been praying for, for this for a long time. Nothing is happening. Maybe God is not listening. Maybe God doesn't want to do anything for me. And you reach a point where you give up. There's no point in praying anymore. So such a person lacks the perseverance to keep praying until God does something. So these are the few things. There could be other obstacles to prayer. But prayer, just to pray to God, is such a struggle. So brothers and sisters, the lesson for today is this. Please clean up your life. Don't do it to please your elders, but do it to please God. Get your prayer life in order. Get your prayer life in order. Today churches are closed, but when the church is closed, does your fellowship with God Go on holiday or does it still go on all this time where we had the luxury of going to church it has allowed us into thinking that everything is okay the church is is there we know that on sundays we can go there we can do what we do on sundays the elders and the speaker will bless us and everything's okay and uh and the church, the church building serves as a refuge for us to, to take the time off from our, from our normal lives, go into a spiritual retreat for an hour or two, and then we come out. Now the churches, now churches are closed, and I hope that it has forced you to think about what true faith, 
true Christianity is all about? Is it about a church and its services, a church building? The church may be closed, may, may be closed, but it should never stop you from meeting God. You don't need a church to meet God. You don't need a church service or church programs to meet God. God is just a prayer away. So revive your prayer life. This is the time to do it. The next thing for us to, to think about is what is mentioned in verse 14. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. News of the raising of Lazarus from the dead was still fresh. And when those disabled people heard that Jesus had returned to the temple that morning, they all rushed to the temple. They came to the temple to be healed, not to pray, not to worship, not to offer sacrifices. They came there to be healed and Jesus healed them. Please don't. It wasn't the temple that healed them. It was Jesus who healed them. So, how does this apply to us? Today, healing is the big thing, isn't it? Healing is a big thing. The world wants healing from the coronavirus. We are all praying for a cure and for vaccines to be developed so that we will feel safe and protected from the virus. Healing is a big thing. The heroes today are doctors, nurses, medical profession professionals, uh, people in the hospitals. The battlefield is not a place where tanks and cannons are gathered. The battlefields are the hospitals. And uh, we want to honor the heroes of today because they are putting their lives on the line. We pray for them and we honor them. But what concerns us is not physical healing. As far as physical healing is concerned, in time, the scientists and the medical experts will or may find a cure. Things will get back to normal with or without the church, with or without prayer. These things will happen. So we are not concerned with physical healing as we look at what Jesus did for the blind and the lame. The healing that the church should be concerned with is spiritual healing. We should be concerned with spiritual healing. Yeah, but we are not blind or lame or most of us. So how can we experience spiritual healing from blindness and lameness? Let's think about spiritual blindness. What is spiritual blindness? Let me give you an example. 1 John chapter 3, verse 17. This is what John had to say. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Yes, there's spiritual blindness. When you look at people around you and you don't see the needs of their life, you don't see their problems, you don't see what they are suffering from, and you don't see that there's a need to help them, that's spiritual blindness. Sometimes you use the word self-centeredness or selfishness or disinterest or self-isolation. We could think of a number of words to describe that, but basically it just means we don't care. We don't care about the people around us. It's not that we cannot see if we want to, but we don't see, we do not want to see, we do not want to know about it. That's spiritual blindness. And it's not characteristic of Christians because we are the followers of Jesus Christ. And what is Jesus' main, the, uh, main attribute? Love. Our Savior is the Savior of love. And if we are to follow in His footsteps, love should be 
a big part of our lives and our character. And to not see the needs of people around us, to be blind to their needs, to, do, to be blind to their problems, is spiritual blindness. And we need Jesus to heal us of this. What about being lame? What about spiritual lameness? What is an example of spiritual lameness? Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 12. And read from verse 12. It says, Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet, so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. That's healing from spiritual lameness. What does it mean? Now, if you look at the entire chapter of Hebrews chapter 12, you'll see that it begins with the idea of a race. In the last line of chapter 1, it says, And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. The Christian life is a race. It's not a 100-meter sprint. It is the marathon. In the 100 meters sprint, you can see the finishing line. In the marathon, you cannot see the finishing line, but you know it is somewhere out there and you've got to reach it. And you've got to visualize the finishing line in your mind, not see it with your eyes. So the Christian life is like a marathon race. We cannot see the end. We know it's there. We've got to reach there. And in order to reach there, we to which we need to visualize Jesus. Jesus is waiting for us at the finishing, finishing line. But there is one thing that prevents us from continuing the race. In chapter 4 to verse, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 4 to verse 11, the writer talks about suffering. He talks about suffering. And he says, sufferings for the Christian it's not judgment, but it is God's discipline. God brings suffering into the life of Christians to make them into better people. Verse 10 says that God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in His holiness. God brings suffering into our lives so that we can become more holy like Him. Verse 11 no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Through suffering and surviving suffering, we develop righteousness and we experience peace. So, suffering is God's discipline on us to make us into better people, into better Christians. The Christian, when suffering comes, is knocked down. And sometimes being knocked down is so terrible that he feels crippled. And he is unable to get up. And he doesn't want to get up. If he stays down, he will never finish the race. So by explaining what suffering is all about and helping Christians to realize that it's actually God's discipline, is something God brings for our good, the writer in verse 12 says, Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Verse 13, make level parts for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. And we look at what's going on around us. The pandemic. It has knocked all of us down. It has knocked down nations. It has knocked down the world. It has knocked down the church has knocked down all the members of the church. People are suffering. People have lost their jobs. People live in fear of whether they'll get sick. When young people graduate from, their, from college, they're going to struggle to find jobs. The world will be a very different place. 
will be a harsher and more difficult place to live in before it gets better. So when we get knocked down, what do we do? Do we stay down or do we get up and go? You stay down, then you experience what spiritual lameness is all about. But God doesn't want you to be lame. He wants you to be healed by Jesus Christ. So you got to get up. You got to get up and get going. Don't allow yourself to be crippled by suffering. Trust in Jesus. Trust God. Even as God brings us through this suffering, we get knocked down badly. You must believe that God has a purpose for it and that God wants good to result from your experience of this time of suffering. Trust God. Trust Him. Get up and let's get going. So, Jesus can heal us from our blindness and lameness. How? Let's follow Jesus' example. Let's learn about Him. In what's going on, everybody is knocked down, they're struggling to get up. Who are we going to learn from? Can we learn from each other? I don't think so. So, the only person we can learn from who got knocked down and who got up is Jesus Christ. We can learn from Jesus Christ as described for us in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 to 30. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 onwards, Jesus says this to us, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. I confess that when I look at this passage, I don't understand it fully. All I can understand from this passage is that Jesus comes, calls us to come and make an exchange, to trade. You have your burdens, you have your cares, your sorrows, your problems. Give them to Jesus. That's what this verse is saying. And in return, Jesus gives us, Jesus takes our heavy burden away from us. He gives us a light burden. And we will find rest for our souls. How can that happen? I do not know. But I trust the Word of God that for all of us who have cares and burdens and we do not know what to do with them, these verse tell us, come to Jesus, give it to Him, commit it to Him in prayer, hand it over to Him and Jesus will take it and He will give something in return which is going to lift up your heart, it's going to bring joy and peace to you. How? I do not know, but it will happen. So, just as Jesus healed the lame and the blind in the, in the temple, He will bring healing to our lives. Now, as we conclude, let's just sum up our thoughts. In cleansing the temple, Jesus challenged the established practice of religion. That this was not the way to God. And he showed us what is true religion. Fellowship with God through his son. And healing from the true sickness, sin. And in doing so, in cleansing the temple, Jesus set in motion the chain of events that would eventually lead to his arrest, trial and crucifixion. Join me as we continue exploring Jesus' journey to the cross in the next video. If you wish to be updated of new videos, please click on the subscribe bot button below the screen. Till then, have a nice day.